You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our International Network Criminal Justice live podcast. And we've just been demonstrating how live it is because my signal has been awful. So I hope you'll bear with us if I dip in and out and that people will be tolerant and understand that sometimes the internet is not perfect. This is the first episode in a series that we've called Just Psychology, when leading psychologists are invited to examine important justice issues and then bring their particular expertise to bear in conversation with a small live audience and Professor Joe Clark from the UK. Now, my name is John Scott, and my only job today is to chair the podcast and invite you to ask questions and contribute to the discussion. Now, thank you very much for joining. Uh, you can find details of future episodes on our website. But the next topic is on organizational resilience and is going to be recorded tomorrow, that's the 29th of May. So if you've got a slot, please feel to read your print to join us tomorrow. Our subject today is going to focus on work in prisons and maybe the pressures of working in groups in prisons. And we hope the conversation will be both lively and interesting. Now, how's this podcast going to work? We're going to have short introductions by both Joe Clark and Pia Puolaka. And then we're going to have a conversation with responses to your comments and questions. And we're going to draw in our small audience and ask them uh, to go live with us and to have a conversation as if it were round a table. And the aim is that your issues and points will shape the content of the podcast. We've not done this before, so we're experimenting and hope that you'll enjoy the, the result. So later on, please use the raise hand or uh, go live on your microphone by unmuting. Or if you prefer, use the chat function on Zoom. And I'll try my best to put the comments or questions to Joe and Pia. So first of all, I'm going to ask Pia and Joe to introduce themselves. It's a rather good way to check that the connections are working. So Pia, say something about where you are uh, what your background is, and what your current interests are. Pia. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to this podcast. And hello, everyone. My name is Pia Puolakka, and I work in the Prison and Probation Service of Finland since 2012. And I'm a forensic psychologist and psychotherapist, and I used to work as a prison psychologist before I came to work here in the Operative Management Unit of Prison and Probation Service. Um, I was uh, a project manager for the so-called Smart Prison Project, implementing Finland's first cell devices with digital services. And my current post is uh, a team leader in the Operative Management Unit, and my team is responsible for various rehabilitative digital and security services in prisons and probations. And I'm still involved with the digital rehabilitation, the smart prison systems, and I've been also part of some AI, artificial intelligence projects here in Finland. And um, I also belong to the Europris ICT expert group. And I was also part of the Council of Europe's uh, expert group developing recommendations for the use of AI in corrections, which was quite interesting. So that's my background. So I'm not sure if we've lost John again. I think we might have done. So I'm just going to dive in here and introduce myself too. So um, again, I'm very grateful to be invited to this podcast. I think it's a a really unusual format. And I really hope that when people listen in, they'll gain a lot from the conversations that we have. 
I used to be a forensic psychologist, but it was last century, which does seem like a very long time ago. So I joined the UK, well, the British and Irish and the Welsh UK prison system back in 1990 um, as a, a young, newly qualified psychologist. And as I reflect on the journey over the last sort of 34 years, I realized that very, very early on in my career, I had an interest in the impact that that type of work might have on the staff who work within prisons. And that came from the fact that at 23, whilst I could have applied to work in a prison, I decided not to because I thought I was a bit young and a bit inexperienced. So I didn't actually join until I was 25. And almost immediately, having successfully got through a recruitment process, I was asked if I would be posted to Albany Prison on the Isle of Wight which some people I'm sure will remember. It's not there anymore because it's been combined with Parkhurst and the other prison on the Isle of Wight, tiny island, and uh, three prisons on it. So, And I was asked if I would go there because Albany was going to become a centre of excellence in the treatment of sex offenders. And I remember vividly thinking, I, I don't think I want to work with sex offenders. I think that might do my head in. So having already um, being concerned about my age at joining the service. I was then concerned about the type of offenders that I worked with and then realized, of course, you don't really get a choice. So, so I did become involved in therapeutic interventions with sex offenders. And I was involved in that for many, many years, both at Albany and later on at Brixton Prison and later on in other prisons where I worked. My interest in how we thrive or survive in those sorts of environments was really peaked when two colleagues took the prison service to court for psychiatric injury. It never actually went to court. It was eventually settled. Um, and these were two extraordinary people who were incredibly committed to their work, very compassionate, uh, kind, committed people who had found themselves incredibly damaged by their experience of working therapeutically with offenders. And because that piqued my interest, I then had an opportunity to go and research the issue of impact on staff at the University of York in the year 2000, so sort of 10 years into my career. And that really has shaped where I've moved on to from there. So I, having finished my, my PhD, went back into the prison service. A very forward-thinking area manager created a job as well-being advisor in high-security prisons, and I held that job for about five years or so, designing and implementing a psychologically informed strategy to support the well-being of staff who worked with some of the most sort of difficult, dangerous, and disruptive prisoners in our system, who were under particular pressures, I think, as a result of the work that they did. So. Having spent many years doing that, I then moved back into academia and was involved in a state probation service of Latvia funded piece. Of, well, actually it was funded by the EU, but driven by the state probation service of Latvia, looking at resilience in criminal justice across Europe, which involved obviously Latvia, the Netherlands, um, Estonia and Bulgaria and the UK. And that piece of research yielded some very interesting information and support for the need to ensure that staff have every opportunity to thrive. And from there, and from everything that I was lucky enough to learn in what we understand as a very challenging environment, then set up my my own small not-for-profit business called Petros. And we specialize in helping all organizations ensure that they provide an environment where people can thrive. Though obviously I have a heart in criminal justice and it remains there. So we do still work with a number of different providers of custodial services and um, and I very much enjoy continuing that work. Although I have to say, Pierre, I think you're probably um, much more involved in frontline prison work than I am. And I'm absolutely aware, one of the things that I find really interesting in addition to these incredible initiatives that you're part of, is just the difference in the prison population now compared with 30 years ago when the the men that and I only ever worked in male prisons, but the men that I worked with sort of grew up in the 60s and 70s in a very different world where there was no technology and no AI. And, you know, the younger younger end of our prison population now were born in the late 90s, 2000s and have grown up in such a different world. So it 
it's fascinating to me and it isn't an area that I know anything about, but it's fascinating to me, the work that you're doing and the importance of, of technology in our prison system and its role in rehabilitation. So I'm so delighted. I mean, I actually, I just want to sit back and listen to you talk if I'm honest, um, but I'd be so interested as well to think about how can we use the technology to ensure that our staff who are involved in interventions with offenders in prisons and in the community, how can that technology support everybody, the prisoners in their rehabilitation, but and the staff as well? So that's that's where I'm coming from. So I'm really, really delighted to be here. I hope I didn't take too long in my introduction. Um, I think we've got John back, but I'm not sure if he can hear. Can you hear us, John? I, <laughs> I, I, I can hear you, uh, <laughs> but I've dipped in and out about a dozen times. That's okay. Um, and um, Rob, who's brilliant and our technical guy says, uh, I, while you two are doing your uh, introduction to uh, the topic, I'm probably best advised to switch my router back on and off in the hope that I can join you without losing things. So what I'm going to do is introduce Pia, who's got a 10 minute topic introduction. Uh, and then as you finish, Pia, hand over to Joe. Uh, and by then I should be back. If I don't manage to get a, a better signal, uh, Rob will then uh, chair the uh, the question time. Um, but I'm really sorry. Uh, I hope the, this bit has been okay. And I'm going to ask Pia to do her introduction, and I'll disappear for a while and hopefully come back to join uh, the the, um, the discussion. Uh, good luck, everybody. Uh, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've been a pain. See you later. See you later. Uh, so I, I think I will start with a short introduction of Prison and Probation Service of Finland, what we are doing and what I'm interested uh, to highlight here in this podcast. And I'm very eager to hear your comments and questions. So Prison and Probation Service of Finland has uh, is or is divided after our organizational change into into uh, five uh, national units. And as I said, I'm working in the so-called cooperations department. We also have a separate uh, department for development, and then for client processes, and then for administration and support services, and then also internal audit unit. And I don't know how familiar you are with Finland, but we are a, we are a small country of five five million inhabitants, and about uh, three thousand prisoners, and a little bit more in in probation, three thousand five hundred per day, maybe. And uh, staff in prisons uh, and probations all together is about uh, two thousand seven hundred. We have twenty eight prisons and uh, 12 probation offices. And um, our policy, I think, uh, is very much about the Nordic Nordic principles of, uh, of criminal policy. And uh, the main task is to prevent recidivism. So we aim that our clients would not return to a prison or a probation office. Our specialty is so-called gradual release. So uh, imprisonment is a process from a more closed prison unit to more open enforcement. And we try to uh, put sentences served in as open conditions as possible. And in the core of Nordic criminal policy is a so-called normality principle. So it's important for us that prison environment should correspond as much as possible to conditions in normal society without, of course, risking the security in prisons. And this also has to do uh, with the so-called import model. So we try to bring the normal services of the society into prisons. And this is where digitalization is also important in Finnish prisons that uh, by a digital means, prisoners uh, also in closed prison units would be able to use the outside civil services of the society 
the same services as other, any other citizen. So this is equality and this is normality. And this is where digitalization can greatly help. And we also call it the digital rehabilitation because uh, prisoners can use the outside uh, services, healthcare, social services, rehabilitative services. And we have a very strong tradition in Finland to use NGOs as our partners in rehabilitating prisoners. Uh, we have quite low prisoner rate compared to European average. And what is also good is that we have exceptionally low amount of underaged and juveniles in prisons. And we also have, compared to other European uh, jurisdictions, we have quite short prison terms. Uh, a great majority of, of prisoners are in prison for less than six months. And uh, a significant part is there less than three months. And we also have a so-called individual sentence planning process for every prisoner. So prisoners' risks and needs are assessed in the beginning of the sentence. And based on those analyses, we try to provide the suitable services for everyone. Uh, I think we have a, a quite high amount of prisoners with substance abuse problems and mental health problems. I assume this is a global global fact everywhere. And um, lately, uh, when uh, when we started to build the first uh, so-called smart prison in Finland, it was uh, our new women's prison that we built in 2020. We then defined our prison concept again. And nowadays, the prison concept states prison as a learning environment for a life without crime and i think this is this is a very very good very good concept and also the digital services provided in the in the three smart prisons we have at the moment the digital services also support the idea that that it's a learning environment a digital learning environment also um in the process of defining the new prison concept, we used a so-called service design model. So we actually categorized all our rehabilitative services in seven different rehabilitative uh, themes. So uh, there's, to state very, very shortly, then there's substance abuse uh, rehab is one theme, criminal thinking uh, and uh, is uh, part of the psychosocial uh, rehabilitation, uh, criminal thinking programs uh, uh, intended to, to decrease criminal thinking and behavior change programs. Uh, social and everyday life skills, uh, part of which are also digital skills, education and vocational skills, health and well-being, uh, social relations, family, uh, family relations and parenting, and then uh, social services intended to reintegrate back to the society. Among the rehabilitative activities, we have a lot of program work, both individual and group work, uh, most of them based on the cognitive behavioral model, motivational interviewing, and we have special programs for substance abuse rehab, behavior management, and then some crime-specific programs for, for example, violent and sexual offenders, and then also women-specific programs. And then our speciality is this uh, digital rehabilitation. So uh, at the moment, we provide the so-called smart prison model in, in three of our prisons, which means that in these three prisons, we have uh, a personal cell device for every prisoner with a special software for communication and managing affairs inside prison, and then also to limited extent interactions with the outside uh, world and the services there, but based or via video calls, including healthcare, education, and our uh, other cooperative partners providing their services. 
And we think this supports the normality principle, so the possibility to use the same services as other citizens. And we consider this to improve prisoners' rights and also rehabilitative outcomes. And we also use in some prisons virtual reality programs for rehabilitation and then also training artificial intelligence as prison labor, which uh, sounds quite exotic, but is actually very simple, uh, simple uh, job. If you want to hear about it more, I can tell. And then we have uh, these uh, AI projects uh, regarding our offender, offender management system. So we could use AI to automate and fasten certain of our assessment processes regarding offenders. About our staff, um, as I said, we have about 2,700 staff members, prison officers, prison officials, senior prison officials, instructors, work supervisors, and also social workers, psychologists, study counselors, prison chaplains, teachers, lawyers, etc. And we also have a specific training in institute for prison officers. And regarding our staff, I think it's important that all staff is required to engage in rehabilitative work besides safety and surveillance. And all staff uh, has been trained for motivational practices. And yes, in Finland, we are also very aware that prisons are a high risk and high stress environment for both prisoners and staff. And for staff, there's a risk for secondary traumatization because uh, staff has to interact with very traumatized uh, prison population that have mental health and substance abuse problems. And sometimes in that, uh, in the, in the, in this particular occupation, it's a risk also for staff to develop problems like this. So the priority should be to ensure occupational safety, staff well-being, support staff resilience. And um, I think ideally our staff uh, should be able to model normal healthy be behavior and relationships in an abnormal environment like prison and the prisoner's subculture. And of course, this is a big challenge. And our staff is doing very, very valuable work when they are trying to to influence influence uh, prison culture and and provide rehabilitation despite the despite the circumstances and i think global challenges in prisons at the moment are there are two overcrowding and staff turnover because the work is so challenging and I think digitalization could support manage these challenges uh, so that we could rely more on the services of the normal society already during incarceration and maybe make staff workflows a bit faster, smoother, maybe less need for prison transfers, etc. And I think uh, the so-called trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive practices and approaches would be important as well as restorative approach when interacting with prisoners. These approaches are proven to support also staff well-being, not only prisoners' well-being. So I think this was the short introdu <laughs> introduction at this point. And let's continue discussion. Joanna, you can maybe put your microphone on. Turn my microphone off because otherwise I'd be so tempted to be asking you questions all the way through because it's absolutely fascinating and it feels like worlds away from what we're currently experiencing in England and Wales, particularly, you know, where people are being released from prison early because there are no spaces, they're being held in police cells. It feels so chaotic. And the way you describe what is happening in Finland feels so calm and measured and thought through. Um, obviously, I'm I'm not here to get political, it's, um, and that would be very easy to do. But I think obviously one of one of the advantages in the Finnish system is that it's much smaller, 
And when when I was looking at the numbers and thinking, well, if you've got um, 3,000 prisoners in 28 prisons, then the prisons are small. And that that gets me thinking about relationships and how important those relationships are between staff and prisoners. And also has me thinking about how do you use digitalization and the building of those rehabilitative relationships. And then I heard you talking about AI taking over some of the prison labor. And I thought that was fascinating. I'd love to hear more about how that works. I know we have one or two of our prisons have got what might be considered smart access in that prisoners can relate to um, and communicate with the outside world through through methods in their cells. I don't know very much about it, but I do know there was some research done by the University of York regarding the impact of that. But it was so basic, I think, compared with what you're describing. And it was just looking, you know, they can order their own canteen food from their cell rather than have to put an application to a member of prison staff. So, and it's really interesting when I hear myself say that, I'm then also thinking, is there a risk that digitalization could break down those relationships? Because prisoners become very self-sufficient. They're able to do lots of things for themselves, which I think is fantastic. But they're also, is I, I guess that relationship between staff and prisoners comes from those necessary interactions that digitalization might remove. So my head is absolutely um, spinning. And I don't know if you want to pick up on any particular part of thing that I've just said, because I've got a million more questions as well. So is there anything in particular? Yeah. Yeah, the I, uh, I think we are still in the beginning of digitalization process here in Finland, but uh, luckily, yeah, out of the 28, we ha we already have the in-cell devices in three. Then, of course, we have open prisons, and uh, in open prisons, prisoners can already use their own devices and um, go to work or study outside of prison, so maybe their in-cell devices are not so necessary anymore. But um, uh, I think this risk of what happens to the interaction is, is good to be aware of. And when we planned the smart prison model, the idea was that we actually could increase interactions by providing also the digital means and di diversify it. And, and um, I hope this is what has happened. And then, of course, if uh, if we face a situation where there's uh, not enough staff, at least there's also possibility to use the services from outside prison to support the difficult situation with the resources, which is not the case in every unit, but um, bringing uh, uh, something additional in this way and also relying more on the outside services actually help with the reintegration and uh, during the imprisonment I think prisoners uh, should learn to be a little bit more independent in taking care of their own things because okay maybe not in yet in prison but when you go outside you have to be able to take care of your own things and of course this is what uh, many prisoners uh, are not very good at so th their skills are not very enhance their social skills, digital skills, and they are in many ways marginalized, also digitally margin marginalized. But in a modern society, if you don't have enough uh, skills, digital skills to take care of your um, daily matters, everything depends in the society to some extent on digital digitalization. If you want to study something or work somewhere, you need the skill. If you want to take care of uh, your applications um, and your uh, uh, social affairs, um, and and even banks are in uh, in in a net bank <laughs> mostly at the moment. So there are there are many reasons why why this can uh, support reintegration actually and not put you more away from from human contacts or, or, or participation in society. It's a, it, listening to you talk and just thinking back when I started the prison service in 1990, there were men who were in prison when we changed to decimalization. So when they left prison, they didn't even know what money looked like. 
and there was no way of them integrating into their local communities or societies to be prepared for that. So they were left completely unprepared for life outside, as you say. So that was something that was just going through my mind as you were talking. And I remember discussions with life sentence prisoners who were who got parole and said they were absolutely terrified because they were so unprepared. Although the thing that struck me, and obviously this wouldn't be for your longer term prisoners, but but your prison sentences are quite short. And I know that the digital world does change very rapidly, but you'd hope in sort of six months or so, people wouldn't get too left behind digitally um, or with technology. But the fact that they are encouraged to keep on top of that is amazing. Do you, do you have any prisons for, for older prisoners? Because one of the things, it's a, a pet thing for me, and it's not really to do with criminal justice, but we've got a, a completely dis- disenfranchised generation. Um, and it must be the same the world over who in the Western world anyway, who don't know how to use computers, don't know how to use a smartphone, would be terrified to be on a call like this. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm a, I have a, a mother in her 80s and she can't go near a computer. So she's completely disenfranchised because she can't do her own banking. And that was one thing that you mentioned. So I'm thinking about your older prisoners and whether or not the smart um, technology is used, being used to support them too. I've got loads of other questions as well, Pierre. I could go everywhere with this. It's so interesting. Yes. Uh, we did some uh, research with an NGO, and uh, we found out that uh, old digitally <laughs> means already somebody in their 30s, which sounds rather young, but in the prison pro- population, uh, the line goes somewhere there like 30, 35. So... People younger than that, they are they were already born into a digital society with social media, etc. So, so the difference is already there, which might sound uh, uh, a bit surprising. But considering that most of the prisoners haven't been part of a very steady uh, working life, or vocational life, or haven't um, uh, educated themselves further. They haven't been involved with the processes that we are familiar who have studied and and went to working life and and so on. So they haven't been trained to many uh, skills that we found like self-evident. So maybe that's why the the divide is already somewhere there in the 30s in prison population. Well, probably regarding digital skills. <laughs> yeah, so, so probably yeah. the the other populations as well as I count myself <laughs> a little bit behind the times. But that it, yeah, that, that's so so interesting to think about how this normality principle, of the Finnish prisons, and especially obviously around digitalization, can look, you know hopefully prevent reoffending. So one of the things I'd love to touch on is it may be a bit early and a bit soon, but do you have any? data around recidivism and the role of digitalization in reducing recidivism? Uh, It's difficult to study yet because uh, our history is quite short. Uh, The first smart prison opened in 2021, Um, but at least we have uh, qualitative feedback, qualitative studies where prisoners' opinion is that uh, when the digital services uh, came, they at least have more possibilities to use different services for their own needs. So they are not restricted to the services that are provided inside prison by prison staff only, but they can, there's more variety. They can use the other services too. And I think this definitely helps with rehabilitation and also helps prison staff because they can also rely on uh, resources more and work in collaboration. So I think uh, one of the most important things has been that there's enhanced uh, collaboration with the outside partners. And we have to remember that there was a COVID period in between our digitalization uh, process. So uh, when the project started in uh, 2018, in 2020 started COVID. So suddenly this digitalization became a necessity. It wasn't anymore that this is something additional, interesting, and and do we need it? But uh, it became evident that, yes, we need it. And definitely, even though it was a very hard period, the COVID time, uh, I think for 
digitalization project, it, it was a kind of a blessing also that um, we could show the difference, we could show the impact and the benefits. And uh, now living the post-COVID time, uh, there's no decrease in digital services, more like increase all the time. So I think COVID also changed a lot how we how we practice rehabilitation in everywhere in uh, in schools in hospitals uh, in social care in prisons yeah everywhere yeah hello again job um so so i have another question which might be slightly controversial i'm not sure you talked i want to talk about staff as well if that's possible but you you talked a bit about you know the main some of the big problems around mental health in prisons and i think that's the same the world over and i don't think we really yet understand the impact of digitalization on our psychological well-being. I, th- I think it would be naive for us to think that the rapid advances in technology don't impact on our ability to thrive in a forever changingly changing fast-paced world. And I think that makes a very strong argument for ensuring prisoners keep up because it would be horrible to come out and you know not be able to jump on that conveyor belt if you like because you don't have the skills to do it. Um, but I, but there are also, you know, there's some very positive uses of technology in the support of mental health as well. And I just wonder, before we talk about staff a bit, what your view is about the role of technology and digitalization and mental health as a psych- from a psychological perspective? Uh, I think there's importance, and uh, we can call it telehealth. Maybe that's that's the term that is a lot uh, used a lot, and I. Uh, also outside prison, we can see that the development is very fast also in healthcare. So at least in prisons, what we see is that again, prisoners are not restricted to the services of the particular prison, but prison staff and prisoners can contact online special services from another unit, uh, from our prison, prisoner hospital, and from the special units we have for psychiatric care of prisoners. So this transferring prisoners to another unit is not always necessary because we can now also consult online. And of course, also we can consult civil services. And of course, um, there's a difference whether the contact in healthcare or psychotherapy is face-to-face or online. But I think there have been many studies that may be contrary to what we believe, not necessarily do the clients feel that the face-to-face contact would be always best or better than online contact. For some, the online contact might be easier. There's a lower threshold for contacting a specialist online than than going to meet him or her in person. And and maybe there's sometimes also it can stay more anonymous and, and, and you can control the contact as a client a little bit more when it's uh, when it's up to you to take the online contact and and see see how you want to use it or not use it mm. yeah i can see that so there are many sides yeah 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 it's fascinating and um, we've got john back so he he might have something to say i should stop right well first of all can you hear me okay fine i'm about two kilometers up the road in my daughter's house and my lovely and my lovely son-in-law has fixed me up on his internet. I heard every word that the two of you were saying, and I can, can't tell you how beautiful it was to hear you clearly. Um, the, the internet is completely down in my area of the town. Uh, we'll, we'll claim that it was a thunderbolt, uh, but as a, I'm so sorry uh, to to be in and out, but it's it's lovely to be able to hear you both. Uh, the problem, of course, is I haven't a clue what you've been talking about. So I'm going to have to listen back to this recording uh, to catch up. Um, what um, what I thought I would do is, uh, as well as apologising to you and any uh, subsequent audience that we have, um, is uh, to, to, to ask um, uh, what uh, particular use of uh, groups that are, uh, in prisons have been uh, are hot at the moment. Um, because um, particularly when uh, I was 
uh, responsible for sex and violence offenders. There were a great use of uh, group work for sex sex offenders. Uh, and I'm wondering whether uh, the investment uh, in group work is regarded as uh, as valuable and cost effective now. Uh, that was that would have been a question that I would have wanted to put to you both. I'd be interested to see what peer, um, how peer responds to that, in this, particularly in the setting of digitalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have uh, we have a lot of program work in in Finnish prisons, and um, both individual work and group work. I think sometimes the highest risk offenders might benefit from individual work also because they might have an influence on others in a group work setting. But this is mostly the case with very psychopathic offenders, for example. But yes, we have a lot of rehabilitational programs, uh, motivational programs, substance abuse uh, rehabilitation programs, anger and violent behavior management programs, and then crime-specific programs, for example, for violent offenders and sexual offenders, and then also uh, women-specific programs. And um, I think uh, we see a value in them. Uh, as you know, uh, sometimes uh, people always ask, well, have you studied the recidivism rates, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And sometimes it's quite hard to find evidence-based uh, uh, amounts of information regarding this. But uh, we believe in program work and, and we orient it from the operative management unit, for example, from my team, I have... Uh, two specialists who are responsible for helping units to organize and manage program work, so group work also. And um, we can also use, to some extent, digital digital means for program work. Uh, if, for example, in, in some unit there's no staff who has training for a specific program, Maybe we can use uh, via video calls uh, staff from member from another unit who has the specific training, and can take an individual uh, to work 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 with him or her online. And then also some of our NGO NGOs as as partners of rehabilitation provide online platforms where prisoners can individually take program like exercises and and work work online and then besides the platform they can use video calls with a with a uh, uh, with a member from the NGO so these are the possibilities we we have at the moment and uh, for example during covid it was uh, uh, we became quite familiar to use the video call connections for for program work too but we could still develop it further. In the smart prisons, we have already had a, have a technical possibility to form inside prison online groups. But I think the best solution would be that any individual prisoner from any unit could join an online national group that so that prisoners from different units could join the same program uh, at the same time online and share their their experiences but there's there's a way to develop towards that direction i think and this could also save resources and uh, solve many problems that we have in some units regarding program work sometimes we don't find enough prisoners in a small unit to form a group or there are other factors motivational factors or prisoners don't want to be in the same group with particular other prisoners and security questions, all the kind of questions that could be avoided in an online group work, maybe easier. It, it, yeah. it would be it would be good to explore different yeah. success different success factors. So, yeah. what works for digital and what works for face to face? What do you think are the different success factors? Yes. Um, well, first of all, building connection and trust in any kind of work is the number one thing. So um, 
Sometimes I've recommended myself that the first meeting should be face-to-face so that you can build the contact and motivate. And then if it seems that it starts to function, maybe you can then also continue online. But definitely um, there's uh, there's uh, different views of what are the benefits and what are the risks of choosing between face-to-face and an online rehabilitation. You get up? Um, so I've just got a, a message through from somebody who's listening about trauma-informed work. So I'll try and respond to that in just a moment. But um, I was also thinking you touched in your touched on in your introduction on virtual reality, the use of virtual reality. And I years ago remember thinking when you, when I first heard about it, how amazing that would be to really allow offenders to test out their newfound skills as a result of group work and programs, you know, their impulse control, their consequential thinking, you know, to really try in a safe environment, what would happen if they made different choices at different times. And I also think that would have an incredibly important part to play in recruitment of staff as well, that staff could actually experience virtually being in a prison. Um, you know, experiencing, I don't know that it's like this in Finland and from the way you've described it, I now have a very idyllic view of what Finnish prisons are like. But I remember walking into Brixton for the first time, having worked in a high security prison for years and then being literally mobbed by about 80 prisoners who were all out of their their cells. It was unlock association time. There were three staff. It smelt really strange. It was such an odd experience. And I'm think, thinking about the use of virtual reality to support both prisoners and staff in their training, if you like, if we use that that word broadly, and what what you think about that and how we might do it. I don't know how easy it'd be, but I think it'd be fascinating. Yes, definitely. Uh, skills training and exposure to uh, real life uh, circumstances in a virtual environment would be helpful. And I know that in some European countries, they are already using virtual reality in training uh, staff that works in security. This is this is what I've understood. Uh, in Finland, we have some pilots with prisoners only, but uh, yes, there are programs to, for example, train social anxiety management, which is very common in prisoners. And then uh, just... Uh, the kind of virtual reality environments that are more for relaxation, mood alteration. Um, I heard that some of these uh, nature-like uh, virtual environments are used for for prisoners who have withdrawal symptoms. So it might alleviate these kind of problems besides social anxiety and, and uh, things like this. We also have one uh, more... Uh, more profound uh, research uh, project in collaboration with the healthcare services for prisoners, which is a separate unit but responsible for prisoners' healthcare in Finland. Uh, and they have a project that uh, uses uh, virtual reality assisted psychotherapy with young offenders with the idea of training young prisoners to behave in a calm way in, in situations that uh, provoke aggression and also to increase their understanding of the other party to train empathy skills. This is very interesting project. And I would see that this kind of skills training programs for prisoners could be very interesting to to use more also. Which actually I think quite nicely leads on to the question that that I got in the message, which is about trauma-informed work, particularly with prisoners, although perhaps also with staff and the the fact that so many prisoners, I would probably actually say all prisoners will have a trauma, a traumaed past. Um, I have yet. To, I mean, even coming into prison is a trauma. So this yes. is in itself, you know. And I remember a colleague of mine doing her master's thesis on the experience of post traumatic stress having murdered somebody. And the trauma that that offender experienced, because as a result of his own offending, so it's almost like self-induced trauma. But um, so the the question was that you know, given that so many offenders have a trauma background, how do we make sure that we can 
we can accommodate that. And I remember in my early days in group work in the prison service, given that a large percentage of offenders who were on the sex offender treatment program would disclose abuse. I'm, I suspect one or two of them tried to use that as a an excuse when it hadn't actually happened, but I think that was really rare. I think probably lots of them who did disclose abuse had been abused and we were absolutely instructed that we don't go there. We don't talk about the mm. offense zone experience at all. Mm. Um, I look back now and I'm slightly horrified that we weren't allowed even to address an individual's experience mm. of trauma and its relationship to their offending. And related to that, of course, all the developments in neuroscience and our understanding of the impact it has on brain development and the functioning of the amygdala and storage of memories. Um, so it, in, in my view, we if we picked up people early as children, and most teachers would be, reliably be able to predict who is likely to end up in the criminal justice system, if we could pick those youngsters up early, we would probably be much better off in terms of not having to address their trauma in prisons. But I just wonder what your view is, Pierre. Yes, I I I think the same way. I, I think the majority has some some kind of trauma background and the crime itself can be traumatic also yeah. for the offender, not only the victim, but for the offender and and, and coming to prison can, mm -hmm. then can definitely also be very traumatic. Mm -hmm. The prison environment is anyway very, very hard. And, and of course, as prison staff, we can uh, try to uh, make it uh, better and, 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 and alleviate the atmosphere. But anyway, prisoners will form their own subculture and it's limited what we can do to prevent uh, what what kind of damage might be done there too yeah. but definitely prisoners yeah. have a high amount of trauma background and i think this is scientifically proven in many of the research regarding trauma informed and trauma sensitive practice i think of course if you want to uh, go through the traumatic experiences that the offender has you must have adequate uh, education and training to do that because otherwise it can damage more but at least uh, prison psychologists, psychotherapists, chaplains, mm -hmm. we should be able to do it because definitely trauma is tied to the offending behavior and substance abuse behavior yeah. even more. Yeah. Then if we think about the, uh, the prison, prison officer uh, staff, the majority uh, who is maybe not supposed to go into detail to start to go through the trauma, but they also should be at least informed and aware that they're, how the trauma affects an indi individual. If a prisoner behaves in a, in a certain way, it can be a trauma response. If a yeah. prisoner is being difficult, aggressive, etc., uh, this can be also trauma-based. So at least for prison officers, it's important to be uh, aware of yeah. how, how, what are the symptoms of trauma, how, how you can see that the particular person is probably traumatized. Uh, how can you see it from his or her behavior and how you're being trauma sensitive, taking into account that probably this prisoner with a high trauma background is a very sensitive to feelings of shame and guilt, even if he or she doesn't show it and how you can align your work and the procedures you have to do regarding that you are you are interacting with a traumatized person. I, do you know, it's so interesting because we recently, as part of my work, have trained um, a whole cohort, about 120 new prison staff who are working with very young offenders. And one of my passions is preparing staff for the job that they're going to be doing. And we, we would refer to working in prisons as a critical occupation. So we know that it's a role where it, um, the experience of it can exert critical impact on your psychological well-being, and yet we don't prepare staff for that. So staff, and perhaps one of the reasons for such high turnover among staff is they are so unprepared for what they're going to face. So we developed a, a training. It's just a day. It's called trauma preparedness, and it's paired with a training resilience skills. And we trained 120 staff in trauma preparedness, and the lovely findings were that it reduced 
uh, sickness, absence, and improved retention. But one of the very unexpected findings, was the staff who had been trained in these versus staff who hadn't, were significantly more likely to get involved in incidents with the offenders, but far less likely to get assaulted. <laughs> and I think the the interesting thing there is that but even though the staff were being trained in trauma awareness for themselves and about what to expect if they experience something traumatic and 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 the kind of responses they might have and what's normal and when to seek advice and so on, there's undoubtedly they transferred that to the youngsters. And I would say in, in the training, every child in there is going to be traumatized. We start the children and they're incarcerated. So although we're doing this training for you, it obviously applies to the youngsters as well. Um, so just bear that in mind. And that was it didn't provide any other um, discussion about the, the children they were looking after. But I thought that finding was fascinating. And I think, you know, if we look after our staff well, and we train them and equip them in the skills that they need, especially around trauma, to look after themselves, that transfers to their ability to look after the people in their care as well. So yeah, as it, it was, it's a really interesting and very unexpected finding. So we were delighted. I'm very conscious of time, John. I've been listening to Peer forever. It's fascinating. Well, in a way, uh, we're on to really important material about um, the skills and uh, characteristics of the staff that you need to engage with uh, people in prisons who, who, who've got issues of their own. And yeah. I'm, I'm wondering um, whether there are specific um, skill sets that you need to uh, be sensitive to uh, run groups or to pick up on trauma-based issues? Or do you think every type of prison officer or prison worker can do it? I, I don't. And I think, but that what's really interesting, and this from my own research into thriving at work, are the very skills that allow staff to be sensitive are also the ones that probably make them more vulnerable. Mm. So do you have to do things to avoid burnout, do you think? Um, yes, but I think some of that falls to the organization and some of it falls to the individuals concerned. We need to absolutely know how to look after ourselves um, and that would require, I mean, I could talk about this as you know forever, John, and I'm really conscious not to get into it in too much detail at this time in the evening. Um, I know we're drawing to a close, but um, I think the organization has a responsibility to take care of its staff to train its staff properly, competence is a key component of this. And I see P and Nodding, I'm sure you agree that we staff need to be prepared for what they're going to face. They need to, when they have those characteristics of compassion and empathy and perspective taking, which is absolutely what we require in a rehabilitative setting, they also need to understand that they're risky and that in terms of feeling overwhelmed and burnt out by their role and therefore particular and specific interventions need to be in place to make sure they they can protect themselves um, from overload. Yeah, we've had a specific question about whether um, prison probation staff training is sufficient to work uh, with prisoners with, 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 with different backgrounds. You think, uh, you think that's the case here? Uh, so the question was that uh, is the training of prison officers enough efficient to face different backgrounds? Yeah. Well, um, at least in Finland, when we train prison officers, um, we we ask the question before the training that what what is your motivation to uh, apply for this kind of training? Why do you want to be a prison officer? I think that's an important question to to ask yourself before you go in, into this kind of training. And then, of course, um, uh, people with different backgrounds backgrounds can, can definitely be suitable for prison work. But I would say that skills like uh, uh, empathy, uh, good social skills, uh, good resilience, that your own, men, that you are, your, yourself, you are uh, balanced psychologically, uh, your mental health bal is balanced. These kind of things are, are important. And also that you know your barriers. I think this is also important when working with traumatized people, that even though if you're empathetic, you have to uh, be able to keep keep your uh, keep yourself um, um, 
not mixing your own own things with the problems that the prisoner brings, if you understand what I mean. And, and also uh, be aware yourself that if you need help to go through the things that you experience in your work, uh, you you should uh, seek for help and of course and as Joanne said, the organization should also support our staff uh, by providing help and understanding in these kind of situations. What, and uh, what what, what yeah. does your what does your organization do to help avoid burnout? Um, we have we we are aware that this is quite quite common in in uh, in high in high risk and high stress environments so so there are uh, um, occupational healthcare services provided in our agency and um, there's also possibility if if crisis situations happen that you can get some kind of a help uh, with the debriefing and going through what happened and i think peer support is also important peer support between uh, prison officers and, and and the staff. And I think uh, um, we we should still uh, raise the awareness of of uh, how how uh, traumatized uh, individuals can affect our, our, us also. And and this would be something that we should do even more. I think so. It's an important topic in the future too. Yes, we'll we'll certainly return to that. I think in in podcasts to come. I'm very conscious that there's a, a drip, drip, drip effect that can weigh you down, but also you can be hit by a wave, a, a, a crisis, uh, and that can also be very, very difficult to handle. I'd, I'd well, love to just respond to that very quickly, John. Do, I Joe. Are, are staff sufficiently trained? And I'd say no. They're trained to do the procedural policy process aspects of the role and the security aspects of the role. They're probably trained very well to do that. That Most staff love their control and restraint training. Um, but I don't think staff are properly prepared to take care of themselves. And I think organizationally, we need many more preventative strategies for staff, which include the recruitment questions are really important, the training and competence, the requirement for levels of autonomy, the meaningfulness of the role, the way the environment works to support staff, all of these things need addressing to prevent burnout as well. There is an individual responsibility. I absolutely feel that's very important because I think it's incredibly disempowering for people if they believe that they they are burnt out because of what's done unto them without feeling they have any part in being able to um, prevent it, seek support when they need it, um, take action to defend, to protect themselves. When we talk about a, the piece of research by uh, Devil's Patton and John Violante on what's called a stress shield, Obviously, you've got to maintain your shield, but it's a really helpful metaphor, I think, to think about how do you prevent that drip, 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 you know, and how do you maintain your shield? What are the things that you do that prevent you becoming unwell? Not what do we do when, to respond when people have become unwell? Because that's too late. You know, we need to prevent it happening in the first place. That's very powerful. Um, I'm, I'm going to look to you both, really, just to see if you've got uh, any reflections um, uh about after our time together. Um, let's start with you, Pia. Is there anything you'd like to, to say that would uh, capture our discussion? Yeah, I think this is very important discussion that we are responsible for both prisoners and staff's well-being and uh, and mental health in, in, in settings like prison is. And as I said earlier, I think training staff for the trauma-informed and trauma sensitive and also restorative approach also helps uh, staff uh, to stay balanced uh, themselves and increases their well being too. And I think this is researched too. And, and also, what, uh, what Joanna said that uh, you can never be too much prepared for, for such an environment as prison is. And I think um, the word I used probably was uh, barriers, but I meant boundaries, of course, that uh, you have to learn your boundaries and what's what's the appropriate distance between you, your work and the prisoner and the prisoner's background. And this is something uh, you probably only can learn while, while learning it by doing it. 
So uh, the training for prison officers can help to some extent. And of course, this issue should be addressed there. But then you then the test is in the real environment, of course. And uh, everything we also discussed about the digitalization, I think, was very, very interesting. And, and in the future, I think there will be even a larger revolution regarding digitalization and artificial intelligence in prisons. So maybe we cannot yet even predict uh, how, in how many ways it can affect how the work and interactions in the prisons will be in the future. But um, I, I hope for the best because there's a lot of good things have been done and, and I think more will be done in the future. <laughs> Great. Um, Joe, reflections from you? I, it's really reawakened and provoked more my interest in virtual reality, both in terms of preparing staff and supporting prisoners and really testing out some of the skills that we teach in group work and the whole aim of rehabilitation to you know help people think in a slightly different way, behave in a slightly different way. So I would love, love to get involved in VR research in in all aspects, as well as our massive advancements in uh, sort of neuropsychology and understanding, you know, the neurophysiology of trauma, of how to treat it, about how to work with prisoners and staff to minimise the risks to them of the whole prison experience. That for me, I'm I'm a bit on fire with that now. I want to go away and learn more. Well, both both of you sound very positive. I wonder if you've got a bit of advice um, to our audience um, who are out there working uh, in prisons in different settings. Do you have a, uh, a word of encouragement that you'd like to sign off with, Pia? Um, I would say that working in prison is a possibility to do very meaningful and influential work uh, regarding uh, the whole society and, of course, the individual lives that we face there. And I, I would encourage encourage to pursue that uh, challenge to work with those that are most uh, damaged and most need help in our society in many ways. Thank you. And and you, Jo? <laughs> well, where do you start? <laughs> um, I think for people working in prisons, Please understand that from the outside, you are probably seeing very differently from the way it feels. And I absolutely echo what Pia is saying about how valuable and important that work is. And therefore, also the importance of ensuring that you're kind of psychologically fit for that work. Treat it like a physical fitness. Learn all the things you can about how to look after your mind in the same way that we essentially know how to look after our bodies. Um, and it will give people longevity in that field. We can draw on their um, experience. And one of the things that's really lacking at the moment in our prison system is experience because so many of the experienced staff have left for various reasons. So the younger people, the younger staff coming through now, we need you to stay there because that's what will help stabilize our prison population and do the really meaningful rehab work. So, you know, investigate psychological fitness, get yourselves well for the long haul because because our offenders, our incarcerated people need you. Indeed. So um, a big thank you to uh, both our psychologist speakers today, Joe Clark and Ia Wurlaka. Uh, we're recording another Just Psychology tomorrow, so if you're able to join us, that's great. We've got speakers from Europris and the Czech Republic, so do join us for that. Um, but I'd also want to invite you to come on the 4th of June uh, because Pia uh, is leading again a webinar this time on artificial intelligence uh, because the Council of Europe uh, is launching uh, standards relating to the use of artificial intelligence across the criminal justice system. And we've got a, a big webinar taking place uh, with speakers from around the world, and Pia is one of those. So lots coming up. Thank you very much for attending today, for contributing, for watching, for listening. Um, this event will also be available as a podcast and at YouTube. So do encourage your colleagues to listen in and join the conversation by visiting INCJ's website at criminaljusticenetwork.org.
www.mediumsmedia.net. So thank you for listening. Goodbye. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.